In this video, I want to give an example of convolution in two dimensions using positron emission tomography. So positron emission tomography is used to image the brain, the heart, the body for looking at various diseases in the body. And often what is used is a fluorine 18 labeled compound such as this example here, fluorodeoxyglucose, which is a glucose analog. What happens is that the radio tracer is injected into the bloodstream and therefore this fluorodeoxyglucose will distribute in the body according to the usage of glucose. What happens though is because fluorine 18 is not stable, um, it decays by positron emission, uh, the fluorine 18 converts to oxygen 18 and we crucially get this antimatter, this positron being emitted from each and every one of the decays of each of these radioactive molecules. What happens then is the complete conversion of matter to energy because a positron is the antiparticle of an electron and there, of course there are many electrons in the body so when these positrons meet the electrons we get this conversion from mass to energy. If you use the um, mass of a positron, the mass of an electron, convert them to energy using E equals mc squared you end up finding that the resulting energy is 511 keV uh, kilo electron volts. So you get two back-to-back -back photon pairs being generated from a positron meeting an electron and annihilating. So what that means is then we have a, a distribution of this radioactive compound, for example, inside the brain of a patient. And uh, the radioactive compound, of course, is labeled with fluorine 18. And that means we get uh, these positrons being emitted um, in proportion to the concentration of this glucose analog in the brain. And what we end up with then are lots and lots of these back-to-back -back photon pairs being emitted from the brain of the patient under study. We detect those high energy photons using a high density array of crystals in the PET scanner. Um, these are necessary to stop those high energy photons to actually detect them. Um, of course, they're energetic, energetic enough to escape from the brain. So this poses a reconstruction problem. Given that uh, we are measuring these back-to-back -back photon pairs being emitted from the patient's brain, how do we go about finding the distribution, the object, the radio tracer distribution inside the brain, which was inside the PET scanner detector ring, the field of view of the scanner. So this is a reconstruction problem. And in this video, I'll just look at how we can do a simple back projection of the data. And in so doing, we end up with a really good example of convolution in 2D. I'm showing here uh, the general case of a radio tracer distribution F as a function of X, Y, and Z, three spatial dimensions, and also as a function of time. Nearly always that is discretized in practice. And so often what we're trying to do is find hundreds of millions of parameters from, in fact, hundreds of millions of those back-to-back -back photon pairs. I've only shown a few example back-to-back -back photon pairs in this simple simulation. So let's take a look at what happens. Imagine then inside that field of view of the scanner that imagine if we just had one single point source. So I'm going to call this a function, radioactive concentration F, a function of X and Y position. So what happens then is I've just copied this over here to show that um, we could have a back-to-back -back photon pair being emitted from that point source of uh, fluorine 18, uh, fluorine 18 labeled FDG. And we will detect that with the uh, ring of detectors that was around uh, the scanner. So imagine there was a ring of detectors that would pick up that back-to-back -back photon pair. What we can do is create um, a separate um, array in computer memory, in MATLAB, whatever your favorite programming language is. And what we can do is just draw a line through that empty array according to the known positions of the detection points of those two photons. And so we just back project along the line along which we detected that pair of photons. And I'll be calling that back projected image a function g. So it's a, a value, a, an amplitude or an intensity as a function of x and y, just like uh, the true distribution we were considering as this discrete 
uh, function f of xy. Now we have a back projected image g of xy. So let's look at what happens if a second back-to-back -back photon pair were to be emitted from that point source. Again, I'm just copying it over here for clarity. There was the point source giving off back-to-back -back 511 keV high-energy photons. They were again detected by a ring of detectors, those high-density crystals, such that we uh, found the photons detected at a particular position here and here. I'm labeling those D3, D4 to show their particular detectors that were used to detect those two photons. And again, we can back project along that line in our separate array that we are creating to form the so-called back projected image. So we just draw a line, that's all we do. Moving on to another example of a third positron emission, giving back-to-back -back annihilation photon pair, uh, annihilation photon pair. Um, so that's what that might look like there. Just to point out, these are these back-to-back -back photon pairs are isotropically emitted, the same um, intensity in all directions. And again, then for a third emission, we can get a third back projected line. And we begin to see that they're intersecting, of course, at the point of the point source. So that after six such back-to-back uh, -back photon pairs have been detected from six um, detected photon pairs, uh, we end up with six lines intersecting in the back projected image. We could keep going. So this is after 1,000 such back-to-back -back photon pairs uh, being detected and back projected. And what we end up with is this kind of 1 over R, this, this uh, distribution, this uh, intersection of points. It's like a, a spokes of a wheel intersecting in the middle. And uh, this, if you like, is what we call a point spread function in our back projected image. Because what's happened is the original point source in the in the scanner field of view, in our back projected image, that point source has been replaced by this point spread function. And this PSF, this point spread function, is a really important concept to understand for understanding convolution. And so we're going to specially label that function H of X and Y, because in fact what we could do is put that point source in the middle of the field of view, and so this would therefore appear in the middle of the field of view and that's what we would call the point spread function h of x and y. Here I've shown a more general case of it being displaced. And as we'll see in a moment, that will be quite important that we can take this central function and shift it to the right and up to locate any uh, predicted PSF um, inside the scanner field of view. So that's what I'm labeling here. A simple model can be used. Each point source, or in fact here just one point source, can be replaced by a point spread function in the back projected image. So that by the time we get to, for example, a collection of point sources, here I'm showing 11 point sources. Uh, these are all of the same intensity. We get the same process that I've just been through for each and every point source, such that after 5,000 such back-to-back -back photon pairs, which of course would have been emitted from all 11 of those point sources, what we get is a back projected image where indeed we can see clearly all those uh, points but now instead of a clean point source what we have in the back projected image is a point spread function centered at each one of the locations of those point sources. So again notice the very simple model that is going on here. In the radioactive distribution inside the scanner field of view here uh, we have a corresponding um, back projected image for that true distribution. So each point source in the true distribution has been replaced by a point spread function in the back projected image. A very simple substitution model. So we could build up complexity. Imagine inside the field of view now, if we had a circle, a square, two point sources and this line here, and we detected, for example, 60,000 such back-to-back -back photon pairs, then this is what our back projected image might look like. And um, you can see that what's happened is that each of these objects is nothing more than a collection of point sources of different intensities. So here we've got a line and two points of the same intensity, and here we've got a circle and a square of lower intensity. But each of these objects and including the line there, is just a collection of point sources and we do exactly the same substitution process. So we get that back projected image 
which corresponds to a model of each of these points being replaced by a point spread function and we are simply adding them together. This is a linear model. In other words, if you double the amplitude of this point here, we would double the amplitude of the point spread function. And you know, if we have a collection of these points, then we have a collection of point spread functions simply added together. This is a summation of point objects. This is a summation of point spread functions. Again, a linear system. So if we get to an even more complicated uh, distribution inside the scanner field of view. So this is not a realistic uh, PET image here, but this is just showing an example cross section of a brain. Um, if we did the same process, but for just 100,000 events, then we'd get a back projected image that looks like this. Now, because I'm dealing with limited number of events here, we have a uh, noise here, but if we carried on to more and more events, then that noise would slowly reduce and we'd end up with a very clear mapping of each point source of different intensity uh, being mapped to a point spread function of corresponding intensity or amplitude. So let's now get to convolution. So what we're saying is those back projected images are built up as follows. So we've got a true radio tracer concentration f as a function of a spatial coordinate x and y and here what I'm doing is I'm labeling the x coordinate and the y coordinate by um, if you like, dummy variables. They're just uh, markers of position inside um, the field of view of the scanner inside that true distribution. So I'm going to use K for the X position and L for the Y position. Okay, so imagine I've got a single point source here. Then what I know is that I need that to give me the amplitude or intensity for a point spread function. Okay, now this is the point spread function in general, which is central, uh, centered in the field of view. But of course, if I've got a point source located over there, then I'm going to need to position that point spread function into the position it at the same uh, location as the point source. So how do we do that? Well, we just do a simple transformation of the independent, independent variables x and y. So that's what I see here. So we can just see I've just shifted that point source to the position k and position L. Now K and L can of course be positive and negative. Here I've got uh, the origin at the center of this uh, black box here. So here uh, K would be uh, a negative value such that we end up with X plus uh, a value to shift uh, the point source to the left and um, Y um, would also be a negative value in order to, to push uh, that point source down. That's assuming that x goes from left to right, um, increasing x value, and that y goes from the bottom to the top there in increasing positive values. So we would need uh, a k and an l uh, which correspond to negative uh, values in order to shift that central point source off to the left and down. So that would give us uh, the corresponding back projected image here. So this is for the case of just a single point source, um, which acts as um, an intensity or an amplitude or a coefficient, if you like, for our point spread function h of x, which is positioned at the location of that point source. So this is just a scale factor or a weighting factor for that point spread function to give us that back projected image. Now, of course, we've actually got a radio tracer concentration in the field of view, which corresponds to many point sources of differing amplitudes. Therefore, we're going to need to visit many locations um, inside the, the scanner field of view, inside that true distribution F. So this K and L is going to need to scan over the whole image um, and basically allow us to consider all the points that might be inside that scanner field of view. So again, coming back to that simple example of 11 point sources, for that reason then we need to do a summation over all the positions K and L. So K and L are like those dummy indices that just index all the X and Y locations. Imagine it as a kind of like a raster scan across that uh, function, which I'm still labeling F of X, Y. It's just that the K and L are just telling us which position we're visiting at any given moment. So in that earlier example, I was visiting that position there, and that meant I had to take H of X, Y, shift it to that position in order to get the point spread function um, in the output. But of course, as we do that raster scan, most of these values here 
uh, are zero, uh, the point sources are not zero, and so therefore as we scan across and hit those point sources, then we end up with a non-zero value for f of k and l to act as a coefficient or a weighting factor for the point spread function h, which is shifted to the location uh, kl that we're considering at any given moment. And when we do that for all positions, that's what we've got to do, the summation over all L and all K. Here I'm doing the rather extreme case of minus infinity to plus infinity for both directions. But in reality, of course, it would be just a finite field of view. We do that summation over all of the point sources, using them as uh, weighting factors or coefficients for point spread functions shifted to the location K and L of each of those point sources. We sum them all up to give us the back projected image. And that is convolution. Now, um, I've also pointed out at the bottom of the slide here that what we've got then is a linear process. Okay, we can just, for example, if we increase the amplitude of one of these point sources, that would increase uh, the amplitude of the point spread function. So it's a linear system. Also to emphasize linearity, what, what that also means is that if we add together more and more point sources here, then we just add together a corresponding number of point spread functions. So in other words, if each of these were to be imaged independently, um, we would get independent point spread functions. And if we image them simultaneously, then what we'd get is the simultaneous uh, collection of point spread functions. Um, one other thing to point out is that this is shift invariant. And what that means is that we use exactly the same point spread function H wherever we are. So the only thing that's changing is just the position of where we shift that point spread function to. But it's exactly the same shape um, wherever we move it to. All we're ever doing is changing its shift position and changing its amplitude. And that's why we say it's shift invariant. The shape of it doesn't change. All we do is scale it up and down according to the value of f. And then, of course, we just have to shift it to every single possible x and y position um, in the field of view, which is indexed by k and l in this example. Uh, so there was uh, the case of discrete 2D convolution. And then I'm just showing you that it very naturally relates to the continuous convolution integral where we've just got some function f, which we index uh, using dummy variables of integration x prime and y prime. It just means visit all the locations in the function f and then use those function values to weight uh, the point spread function or the kernel of the convolution h. And of course, that's just a function x, y. Um, but it's called shifted to x prime and y prime according to the location we're considering in the true function f. And then, of course, we've got to sum it up over all of the possible x, y positions. We do all that summation and we end up with, on the left-hand side, a function of x and y only. So notice the integral has been over x prime and y prime to visit all the locations in the input function f. And then if we're integrating over x prime and y prime, then we're left with just the x and the y of the original um, point spread function here. And so we end up with a g of x, y on the left hand side. Just to give one more closing example for this presentation, here's another uh, 2D uh, brain image for fluorodeoxyglucose uh, simulation for PET. That's the input uh, function here. Then we've got a, a very excessive uh, point spread function blur here just to prove a point. And so if we convolve this function with this function, so this is often called the kernel or the point spread function, then we get a convolved image g of x, y. And that is the integral equation I've just talked you through. We're just saying we've got point source amplitudes or intensities f at positions k and l. We just visit all those positions, use them as weighting factors for the point spread function x and y shifted to each of the locations in the function f. And of course, we've got to sum up over all positions K and L in order to get the overall convolved output G of X, Y. And just a reminder again of the continuous version of that integral. Thanks for listening.